Hi, welcome back to 5-Minute Physics, the last of our uh, discussions on black holes, I think, but the one that leads to their biggest mysteries in the last week uh, before we go on to other things in the last two days. So let's go. Oh, by the way, this is the manuscript for the new book that finished yesterday. I'm excited about that. Let's get on to black holes, however. Um, okay, here's what we know. A black hole of mass m has a, a radius r and event horizon, inside of which the, speed, the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. The event horizon in appropriate units, where all the other constants are, are 1, is 2 times the mass. Basically, the event, size of the event horizon goes as the mass, and it's twice the mass of the black hole. The acceleration at the event horizon goes down as 1 over 4 times the mass of the black hole. It gets smaller for large black holes. Remember, you uh, feel smaller acceleration as you fall through the event horizon in the frame of the falling observer. We'll talk about different frames later. Next, if you're falling from infinity, cl classically in an Newtonian sense, we calculated the change in potential energy, and that was um, 1 half mc squared. So it told us that basically you're losing an amount of energy that's almost the rest mass of the object. So you're moving relativistically, and that's when you have to go beyond Newtonian mechanics. But the fact that you're losing so much energy is one of the reasons that quasars are so bright, because gas that's falling into those quasars loses almost their entire rest mass falling in, and that and emits it in radiation and in, in light and heat, and that's why big black holes are surrounded by gas, and, and they're very bright because the gas falling in emits lots of energy. The other thing is that, and this is the biggest surprise that Hawking discovered, that black holes radiate at a finite temperature, but the temperature goes down as 1 over the mass of the black hole. Big black holes are cold, small black holes are hot, and they'll eventually evaporate. A big black hole like the mass of the sun, however, is a temperature of something like uh, 100 millionth of a degree above absolute zero, so um, it's it's very, very cold. But eventually, they will evaporate. Okay, now there's two things that uh, we want to talk about today before we get to the mysteries. One is the entropy of a black hole. What's entropy? Entropy is basically related to the amount of information stored in a system, but entropy, entropy in thermodynamics is literally the total number of internal configurations a system can have at any given temperature. The, more, the greater the number of internal configurations it can have, the greater the entropy. Uh, it's like the gas in this room. All the molecules in this room can be in many different configurations, all at the same temperature. And that's related to the amount of information you can store, because if you want to think about it as a computer, you can store information in each different configuration. And, uh, and so if there's a lot of configurations at a finite temperature, there's a lot of entropy. But the way we calculate entropy, the change in entropy, is related to the heat we add at a given temperature. So we add a little bit of heat energy and, and it increases the number of configurations that can exist at that temperature. That increases the entropy. Now, for a black hole, we know the temperature is 1 over 8 pi m, so this is related to 8 pi m. But the amount of heat you add to a black hole, the amount of heat energy, just changes the total energy of the black hole and therefore the mass of the black hole. So this, this is the amount of change in entropy when you add some heat. Now let's think about it. If I think of um, if I think of a black hole of mass m, and then um, or think of starting at, at rest and adding and adding uh, at starting at zero and ending up at m, as I add little bits of heat energy and l add little bits of mass, I'm adding little bits of mass delta m during that process all the way up to m. But the average mass during that time is m over two. So to create to make a black hole of mass m, I've added little bits of heat energy, and, and it, I get m average times delta m, and the sum of delta m's is m, and m average is m over 2. So this becomes so this becomes 8 pi basically delta m squared over 2. To go from zero to here, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be basically doing delta m squared over 2. And I can write this, therefore, as delta 8 pi delta m, well, let me make it 4 pi m squared. So the change in entropy as I, as I add heat is, is, is delta 4 pi m squared. And that means, basically, the entropy of a black hole is, to go from 0 to the mass of the black hole, is 4 pi m squared. But now let's look at that. That, the radius is 2m, and therefore, if you think about it, this is pi times the radius squared, uh, the event horizon, and that's the area of the event horizon over 4. 
So this is the important relationship. There's a relationship between the black hole en entropy and the area of the event horizon. Now that's very suggestive. It's, su it's su suggested to a lot of people that somehow the relationship between the information stored in a black hole and its area, and we'll come back to that. The last little thing we need to know, however, is it relates to the f something that wasn't relevant in Newtonian mechanics, but certainly is, and once we realize that general relativity applies to black hole, black holes. That's the frames of reference. The fact is, because you're losing a lot of energy uh, and you're speeding up as you get near a black hole, when you fall near a black hole, you experience time dilation. And in fact, because clocks change at different rates and different points in a, in a, in a gravitational field, you, uh, you experience gravitational time dilation. And clocks slow down as you get near the event horizon, because one way to think about it is if I, if I, um, uh, if I uh, uh, have a, a, a radiation, a, a light wave of, of, of wavelength lambda, um, as it tries to climb out of the black hole, it loses energy, and the wavelength increases, but if, and that means the frequency de decreases. But if you think of each, uh, each uh, cycle of the wavelength as a tick of a clock, you'll see that the clock will slow down. So what happens mean, what that means is basically if if I if if this if I'm looking at a clock ticking near the event horizon of a black hole, it appears to have slowed down considerably. And in fact, the wave the a clock will basically slow down and at the event of horizon the event horizon it'll stop. And one way of thinking about this is that the wavelength of light that's that you'll see at infinity compared to the original wavelength of light um, that was emitted goes to infinity. That means the frequency of light that's emitted if, uh, if, uh, by an object near the event horizon of a black hole appears to go to zero. It, there's a, there's a, an infinite redshift. It becomes longer and longer wavelength. And we can actually write this down. I'll write it down because um, in general relativity, um, the, the ratio of those wavelengths is 1 over the square root of 1 minus the radius of the event horizon over the radius that you're measuring it at. So this means um, uh, that, um, sorry, the radius at which it's emitted. So this means that if I'm emitting light at the event horizon, this is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, this 1 over 0 is infinity, and that means there's an infinite redshift. Well, that's all, that's all the preparation we need to have for, to discuss the three major paradoxes of black hole evaporation. The first is this fact. The fact that there's an infinite redshift means that clocks slow down to zero. That means if you're watching someone fall into a black hole, then, um, then you will, uh, their clocks will basically, oh, sorry, looks like I've run out of paper. That's okay. I don't need it. If you see someone fall into a black hole, you'll never see them fall in. It'll look like it'll take an infinite amount of time for them to fall into the black hole. Now, that's the reason, by the way, that black holes are called frozen stars in Russian, because basically, you'll never quite see anything fall in. Of course, as it falls in, the light from that observer falling in will get redder and redder and redder, and the wavelength will increase, and eventually it'll disappear. But um, uh, the fact is that it'll, it, that basically, as, as seen by an outside observer, time stops at the event horizon of a black hole. So you never really see, observe anything fall in. Now, the first paradox here that I want to point out is, okay, well, that's, that's kind of crazy because I've told you that black holes evaporate in a finite time. Now, therefore, it, in some sense, if you're watching at infinity, the black hole evaporates before it appears to form, in that sense, if you watch it form completely by things falling in. Now, as I say, as observers fall in, they eventually disappear before they hit the event horizon because the light from those objects redshifts. But um, uh, uh, that, that, that fact that there's something strange happening at the event horizon, that objects disappear and that, you, and that, that black holes appear to basically, time appears to stop at the event horizon of a black hole for an observer in infinity, is one of the strange things that's related to... Um, to the other major paradoxes. And, and, and the second major paradox relates to the fact that black holes evaporate. Because, um, remember, 
things are falling into black holes, and 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 a black hole is storing information. It's got entropy, and the entropy is related to the area. Now, it, that wouldn't be a problem. In some sense, the information of what falls into a black hole disappears behind the event horizon of a black hole, and that's fine if the black hole stayed there. It's like saying, I put something into my basement, I close the door, I don't remember what's down there. There's no, no funny physics involved. But if a black hole evaporates thermally, and thermal radiation carries no information, just the temperature of the black hole, so it doesn't tell you what fell in. If the vapole event, black hole keeps radiating and radiating and radiating and evaporates, then where did the information go? In quantum mechanics, information is preserved. And, and, and certainly the black hole appears to have, when it first forms, lots of entropy, lots of information. Where does it go when the black hole evaporates? That was the information loss paradox that was first sort of elaborated on by Hawking. Hawking radiation suddenly gave a paradox for quantum mechanics and general relativity that, st that stood right in our face. That somehow, if black holes evaporate and all that information is gone, you've violated a fundamental law of quantum mechanics. Now, a lot of people have hit on the fact that the entropy is related to the total area of a black hole to say maybe, maybe there's something happening near the event horizon. Maybe somehow the information is stored on the surface of the black hole. All the information of everything that fell inside is stored on the surface of the black hole. There's lots of reasons to think about that. Remember, one uh, the argument we gave for radiation being emitted is that virtual particle and antiparticle pairs are formed near the event horizon. One fell in, one went to infinity. So maybe the quantum processes on the surface of the black hole um, store, by some unknown quantum correlations, information that's carried out by the particles that go out to infinity. And lots of physicists over the last 30, 40 years have been trying to explain that. And string theorists have been arguing, oh, they can try and understand that argument about maybe how information is released by the black hole when it radiates. And I have to say that, in my opinion, it's still a mystery. We still don't really haven't... Re a lot of people think they've solved the problem of what happens to the entropy of a black hole when it evaporates, and lots of claims have been made. But, as I like to say, the claims are nowhere near as easy to express as the problem. And when that's the case, um, it's still, I think, a little uncertain about what the situation is. So this is the probably the information loss paradox is probably the biggest, biggest mystery of black holes. But the last mystery of black holes also relates to the event horizon. Remember, the ratio of the Ra wavelength of radiation you see at infinity compared to the radiation emitted near the event horizon of a black hole, that becomes infinite. That means that um, that that when I if I think about it at infinity I'm me measuring radiation at a finite temperature, but the wavelength of that radiation when it was emitted you might think would be much smaller because it's redshifted by the time it gets out to me, and that means you might imagine basically. The temperature, you would think, if you're measuring it to be finite infinity, the, rate, the temperature near the event horizon looks like it becomes infinitely large. Something strange must be happening near the event horizon. It becomes so crazy that this, this has become called a firewall, that maybe you might think in the frame of, of an observer near the event horizon that they'd see almost an infinite wall of radiation coming out. And that seems very, very strange, because remember... The acceleration near the event horizon is very small, so you'd think classically, as you fall through the event horizon, you'd see nothing strange. But uh, again, string theorists in particular have argued by trying to understand microscopically small scales near the event horizon, you might explain that firewall and you might explain how it sort of destroys information that propagates through there. There's lots of talk. There's lots of heat related to black holes. I'm not sure there's so much light. Black holes represent something that physicists love, a paradox, because we don't yet have a clear quantum theory of gravity. String theorists think they might have that, but, but, but it's not a clear quantum theory of gravity yet, and at least not the quantum theory of gravity that explains our universe. And it's wonderful to have a paradox that you can focus on to try and see how you might bring together and rationalize a theory so that so that quantum mechanics becomes consistent with general relativity. The black hole paradoxes having to do with the, with the lo information loss, the, uh, the freezing of things near the event horizon, and this firewall are the three paradoxes that are driving physicists to try and think how they can 
apply quantum mechanics and maybe string theory to resolve these paradoxes. And if they do, that may lead us to a, a, a quantum theory of gravity that, that everyone accepts, that is clear, and that might ultimately relate not just to the final moments of black hole evaporation, when, when you've gone down to a basically close to the singularity of a black hole, but maybe to the origins of our universe, when our universe began potentially out of something that might have been a singularity. So black holes, which classically are quite interesting, but not that, as I tried to argue, not that exotic. When you apply quantum mechanics to them, they become much more exotic, and you result in these paradoxes, which I hope I've been trying to explain in a, in a relatively clear way, uh, what the origin of those paradoxes are um, in, in a little more than five minutes, but uh, we'll still call it five-minute physics. So that's it for black holes, and we'll move on tomorrow to bigger questions about mysteries in the universe. Take care.